All right, welcome back. So let's say you just picked up a brand new Synology device. You're new to the ecosystem and the NAS market, and you're finding the new the configuration a bit overwhelming. Hopefully you went and put a few drives in it. Maybe you've opened up the DSM and configured a couple shared folders, but you're not sure where to go from there. So in this video, we're gonna walk through five configurations I recommend you look at on a new Synology. And there's gonna be much more you wanna dig into after this, but I think these five are a good starting point to you know, get you started, get your device into a good state. And then as we go th through each of these, you'll see them as good jumping off points to try and learn about other configurations and learn more about your Synology device. So with that, we're gonna jump right into the first recommendation, which is to set up two-factor authentication on your account. So I'm gonna pull up the DSM right here. And to get into the two-factor authentication setup, what you're gonna to wanna to do is go up to the upper right corner here and click on this little person icon. You're gonna click the personal menu. I'll bring up information about your account. And you're gonna click security. And here you can config configure two-factor authentication, which I already have set up, as you can see. You can also configure a hardware security key, which is another option if you wanna go down that path and manage hardware keys. But this is an easy first step to securing your Synology device. Now, you can also require all users you add to the device to use two-factor authentication. And if you wanna do that, what you're gonna to wanna to do is go into the control panel, go into the security tab, and you click on the account tab. And here you'll see you can enforce two-factor authentication for different sets of users. Now, I don't have this configured on mine yet since I don't really have anyone else using it significantly, but this is something I would recommend setting up as well. All right, so number two, enable shared folder checksums. Now, unfortunately, you need to do this when you're creating a shared folder. So if you have already gone through and set up your shared folders, this may be a little extra work if you want to enable this feature, but I highly recommend it. So let me just show you how to do this right now. I will show you on some existing shared folders. Actually, it'll be disabled. But what you do is we're going to go into the control panel. We're going to choose shared folders and I'll just pick. I'll just pick any one of these. My photos folder. And in the advanced tab, you can see, and this is grayed out because this shared folder already exists, but enable data checksum for advanced integrity. And so what this will allow you to do is in the, the BTRFS file system, and I'll just jump over here to the, the documentations on it, you can read all about the checksumming capability built into the file system. But what it's gonna do is whenever you write a file, it's gonna store a checksum next to that file as well. And this will allow your Synology to go through and verify that the file is actually intact by checking uh, the file content against the checksum. So I highly recommend setting this up. And if you have shared folders where you haven't configured this, again, if you have a new device, it may be worth going through and recreating those shared folders and enabling data checksumming. Now, just to jump back to the ButterFS file system documentation and provide a bit more information on this. So we can, uh, we can read along here. So data and metadata are checksum by default. The checksum is calculated before write and verified after reading blocks from devices. The whole metadata block has a checksum stored in line in the B tree node header in each data block has a detached checksum stored in the checksum tree. So that tells you a little bit more about how the checksumming works. And I would imagine, though I don't have any data to back it up, that there is a performance penalty with storing this additional checksum and calculating it each time. My assumption in kind of going through these recommendations is you are kind of a new Synology user, you're setting this up for the first time, and you really just want secure storage of your information and you're a little bit less concerned with performance. So if you're setting up a Synology maybe and you're filling it with SSDs and you're gonna use it for say video editing, maybe this is something you would wanna consider not using, but again, I'm coming at this from a, a simple setup to have the highest data integrity possible. So that is data checksumming and you're gonna need this set up for our third recommendation, which is uh, enabling data scrubbing. So data scrubbing, like I just said, depends on uh, data checksumming to be enabled. So to get to data scrubbing, 
We're going to go back and what we're going to do is open up the storage manager. Which is right here. You open up your volume and up here at the top, you can see an option to schedule data scrubbing. And I highly recommend setting this up. So what this will do is this will leverage your checksums to go through and verify that all the checksums align with the data that you have stored. So it's gonna do this on a periodic basis and it gives an opportunity for the system to self-correct even if you don't have any drive errors or anything else. What this can control for is if you have a case of an interrupted write, say you have a power outage or something else and your data didn't get stored correctly, it, this data scrubbing process will check this. So again, highly recommend setting this up. Now on to number four, and that is enabling snapshot replication. And snapshots are gonna allow you to capture the state of your files at a particular point in time and quickly be able to roll back to a different point in time in the event that you need to, to recover an old file, etc. And the great thing about snapshots is they're very cheap. They don't use a ton of storage, so you can have many snapshots and roll back to different points in time and capture different states of your file system. So to capture snap, so to capture, to configure snapshot replication, we're gonna go, we're gonna open up the snapshot replication app. And you can go into the snapshots tab and here you'll see all of your shared folders. And you can see I have a bunch in here and I have repl snapshots enabled on some of them and not on others. But I'm gonna pick something that I think most people would want snapshots enabled on, which is maybe their photos shared folder. And you can click settings. And here's where you can enable a snapshotting schedule. And you pick the schedule, whatever works for you. Uh, I have mine kind of going once a day and then you can also pick a retention period. So if you don't enable this, the snapshots will continue to accumulate over time. Yes, they will take up space and eventually that could become an issue. So what you do is you can enable a retention policy and you can define to keep a certain number of snapshots or to keep snapshots for a certain number of days. Now, if you, you may have seen this here, I have uh, an immutable snapshots enabled and I'm just gonna pause on that one for a second. I'm just going to show you one other thing. So if I look at my documents folder, again, that's a very small folder. I just have some Word documents, Excel, things like that in there. I have this snapshotting every two hours. And just in case, like if I, if I lose a document or something happens, I want to be able to get back to that regularly. Now let's talk about immutable snapshots. And I do want to have a call out. There's another great content creator named Space Rex who did a whole, um, uh, video on immutable snapshots and how they can help with ransomware, etc. But think about an immutable snapshot as a snapshot that cannot be deleted pretty much under any circumstances. The snapshots when it, that are normally created, you can go in, delete them. If you're an admin, you can remove them, etc. There is no way to remove an immutable snapshot, which is great. So if something really bad happens to your machine, like in the case of ransomware, et cetera, even if someone has admin access to your machine, in theory, they cannot delete an immutable snapshot. And so you may wanna consider enabling these. The one downside is that because they cannot be deleted, if you end up running out of space, you're gonna to have to wait the retention period to get that space back, or you're gonna to have to look for other ways to reclaim space, add drives, do something else. So as you can see for my very important data, I do have immutable snapshots enabled and I recommend that as well. Well, I recommend looking into it for your, your most critical data. And just, just to show you how I set it up, I put up, I set up snapshots on what I consider to be most important data. So photos, uh, documents, I am running a little Git server and I wanted to be able to roll back just in case uh, of an issue there and for my home directories. And so for other things like my media server, I was playing around with the Proxmox backup, don't really need snapshots on here, don't care. So that's uh, recommendation number four, which is setting up your snapshot replication. So that was recommendation number four, but I actually forgot one thing. I just wanted to show you, that's how you configure snapshots, but if you go over to the recovery tab, if you need to get data from a snapshot back, this is where you can do it. So if I went into, my documents folder and I click recover, 
here's where I can see all of the snapshots that have been stored for this folder. And you can see I have 370 of them, maybe a bit much, but it's nice. And you can see which ones are immutable. And so I could pick one of these and I could choose to restore everything to that snapshot. I can actually choose to browse the snapshot, which it's telling me here, I have to make the snapshot visible, which then I'd be able to see it in the file system. But if I did that, I could actually browse the snapshot as if it was a, a folder and I could pick out individual files I need, which is great if you need to get a single file back. So that's how you use snapshots for recovery. Okay, now that's the end of uh, recommendation number four. Now let's move on to recommendation number five, which is configuring hyper backup. So if you think about kind of what we've gone through so far, we set up two-factor authentication. Great, that makes uh, your Synology more secure. We've gone through and enabled data checksumming to make your data more secure. Then we enabled data scrubbing, which is another kind of level of making your data more secure. Snapshots, one more level of making your data more secure. Now we're gonna, and so now you have all your data and your accounts secure on your Synology device. But of course, if something happens to the Synology device, fire, theft, etc., cetera, uh, your data is still potentially lost. So that's where hyper backup comes in and kind of built, doing an offsite backup is an important part of a backup strategy. And hyper backup, now, as I kind of said at the beginning of this, you can dive into any of these topics much deeper and hyper backup is one of them. There are entire videos and lots of information on all the ways you can configure hyper backup and how to make it best for use ca your use case. But I'm gonna just kind of give you a quick walkthrough so you get a flavor of what it's capable of. So you go, you open the hyper backup app. All right. So I do have a, a backup set up, which I'll come back to in a second. But assuming you have nothing set up and you wanna add a new backup, here's what you can do. You can choose to backup specific folders or packages, or you can choose to back up the entire system. Now let's just pretend for a second we wanna back up the entire system. I'll choose that. And you can see you have two options. So one is to use Synology's storage service, which obviously there is a, a fee associated with that. And you can kind of go dig into all the fees and if it's worth it. And I actually haven't really looked at this too much, but I, I gather it is pretty good and simple and well integrated with this. and you know, probably a good path worth looking into. The other thing you can do for a, a full backup is a remote NAS. So imagine if you have the ability to put another Synology device somewhere at a friend's house, family member's house, you could do a complete system backup to that device. Now going back, if you want to back up individual folders or packages, you have many options. Similarly, you can back up to Synology C2 service. You can back up again to a remote NAS but here you can back up to a local shared folder. And by the way, that means a local shared folder on the Synology. You can back up to a USB, which is great. So you can back everything up to a USB drive once in a while and take that offsite to a secure location. Simple method and it works. And I've done that quite a bit. Then you have the option of backing up to various different cloud services, Dropbox, Google Drive, S3, etc. And then you can back up um, to another file server using rsync or different methods. So like I said, you can kind of dive into each one of these and find out what's right for you. You can figure out like how much you want to spend on an offsite backup. And if you want to use a cloud service, if you feel comfortable having your data there, if you want to pay the monthly fees, et cetera, there are many options. Now, what I ended up doing, so what I do, I just do an, a USB drive for an offsite backup and I take it somewhere else. I haven't had time to kind of look into a cloud-based solution yet, but definitely something I'm going to look at. But the other thing I have set up is I was playing with kind of some additional hardware I had around the house and, and getting like a home lab set up going. So I set up a, a TrueNAS uh, server on another piece of hardware. And if you're not familiar with it, TrueNAS is another uh, storage service. Some people love, and I would just want to play with it and see what its capabilities were. So I set up this other storage pool on TrueNAS, and I basically set my Synology uh, to rsync over to the, tr the TrueNAS instance, I think once a day. Now, of course, this doesn't solve the, uh, the offsite backup problem, but it does give me an option in the event that something really bad happened to the Synology. All right, so that covers hyper backup.
as a starting point. And I think that takes us through, yeah, I got my list here, all five of the uh, recommended, you know, configuration items you look at with your new Synology, but we're not gonna stop there. We could probably go on and do like 20 or 30 of these, but I'm gonna, I'll give you one more. All right, and the one more item is number six on our list for today is I highly recommend checking out the Synology apps and in particular, the Synology Drive, Synology Photos. You can check out Synology Office as well. They, to me, they really make the Synology device, I was gonna say special, but really valuable for household environments, allowing you to create like cloud applications in your home and get away from applications like Google Drive, OneDrive, et cetera, if that's what you wanna do. But I actually find the applications to just be much better for those purposes. And so I'll give you a quick, a quick kind of dive into some of them. For me, Synology Drive is, is one of the best uh, applications for file sharing around the household and even outside of the house. So, and it, and it actually adds a, another layer of security over your data. Uh, so with Synology Drive, and I opened up the Synology Drive console app here, you'll need to install this. What you do is you set up team folders and you can see here, these are most of my shared folders, which I, I have enabled as team folders. So for example, documents, uh, photos, etc. And then what you can do is you can access these through mobile apps. You can install client applications on other devices, etc. So let me just show you, there are also web uh, interfaces as well. So I have these, these shared folders enabled on Synology Drive. And then you can open up the Synology Drive interface, which looks a whole lot like Google Drive. And I'm sorry, a lot of this is blurred out as this is actually my, uh, my running Synology Drive. So you can go through, you can open these files, edit them, etc. And one cool thing Synology Drive does, on top of everything else we just rent, went through, it stores versions of files on top of everything else we just showed. So you have snapshots, you have all the data check something. Synology Drive is going to store file versions as well, making it easy to roll back to those versions uh, in the case of a, a problem, conflict, etc. Let me just show what it looks like when you, so this is uh, on the DSM, and then over on a Windows device, you can basically, you install the Synology Drive client, and you tell it what files you want or what folders you want to sync over. So let's see if we can get that up. So this window here, this is running on uh, my Windows PC. And you can see I have three folders uh, with Synology Drive syncing over, and this is two-way sync. So what happens is I actually can have these files sitting on my local PC. I can edit them locally so I get the speed of all of that. And then when changes are saved, they will get synced back to my Synology device. And similarly, when changes happen on the Synology device, I'll get them here. So I'll just show you a folder real quick. And here's what that looks like. And it just looks like any other folder in Windows. Uh, the key thing is you can see the status here shows if it's in the cloud or if it has a green circle, that means it's local. And so anything in the cloud is not taking up space on this device. Of course, if I go in and I, I can start to work on one of these files, I can download it and then um, I can actually have it free up that space if I no longer need it. And you can then imagine that this client is now installed around different computers in your household, and it's a great way to share files uh, throughout the house. So that is Synology Drive. Again, quick introduction. And Synology Photos, very similar to a Google Photos and iCloud Photos-like application where there's a really nice web interface you can see all your photos kind of sort through them. You could connect that through Plex and a media server to show on different devices in your household. But once you get all of your photos and data onto your Synology and you, you uh, install Synology Photos, it pretty much takes it from there and builds a great interface. And again, now all of your data is on your Synology in your house, easy to access too. I think you could spend a lot of time learning about the features of the Synology applications, but to me, they're a real game changer with the Synology product, and I highly recommend digging into them. So with that, that pretty much wraps up this video. Those were uh, five plus one things worth digging into on your brand new Synology. Happy to show more. I think we could kind of keep the list going, as I said before, but if you have any questions or comments, please drop them down below.